I'm Anita Tebbe, and I'm here to visit with you today about United States presidential libraries and museums. And thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited about this uh, presentation, and I hope uh, you will share my enthusiasm by the time that I finish. Before we actually get started, I want to introduce Phyllis uh, Moore, M-O-H-R. <laughs> And uh, she is my uh, computer expert. I'm uh, insecure in this area and she just is here <laughs> to help me. And she uh, obviously helped put together this wonderful uh, PowerPoint presentation. So let's uh, get started here and um, let's look at the title. And the title is United States Presidential Libraries and Museums. And that's what the title page is right here. And uh, one of these museums is Eisenhower's front and the other is Truman's front. And the first thing I wanna say to you is um, that um, these, we have uh, 13 presidential libraries and museums, and we have about five US statutes that deal with this area. So whenever you talk, sometimes I talk about libraries, sometimes I talk about museums, but they really go together. It's one package, two parts to it. So today we're concentrating on the museums. And these are two that we have in our immediate area, which we're very fortunate to have. And you can see it's the front of them, as I mentioned before. And I don't know if you know the difference, which one is which, but if I tell you that one is made out of limestone, uh, you probably can guess which it is. And that would be the Eisenhower one, which is at the top. And this is very typical of libraries, uh, pardon me, of museums uh, and libraries, that they're made, they have some connection to the place in which they were built. And we know being from the Kansas area that limestone is very important to this area. And then the bottom one is Truman's. Um, what we will find out is, in going through this presentation, is uh, just to give a couple examples, President Reagan's Library and Museum, which is just in the, uh, it is in the LA area, just about uh, 40 minutes north of the airport to be exact, um, it uh, has the Spanish motif. So it's like a Spanish um, um, adobe. And if you uh, go to FDR, Franklin Roosevelt's Library and Museum, it is uh, much more the Dutch look. And that's because President Roosevelt knew his history and knew there was a huge Dutch um, influence in that area before um, the English came. Now, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna do a few things. I'm going to give you an overview of the five W's who of the libraries, what, where, when, and why. And then we're going to look at the two museums that we have in our immediate area, the Truman one and the Eisenhower one. And then we're going to end up with the last library that's been built as we talk, and that is um, uh, President Obama's. So we'll move to the next page. And this is a wonderful slide here, it has so much information on it. And these are our 13 US presidential libraries and museums. And the number 13 is important because if you do a lot of reading, sometimes they say they're 14, sometimes they say they're 22. And I'm not a mathematician, but I like being exact. And there are 13. And 13 means they're connected with the National Archives and Record Administration. Uh, there are some libraries in the United States, presidential libraries that are very nice and very good. And one that immediately comes to mind is Abraham Lincoln's in Springfield, uh, Illinois. It is not a presidential library. It's not under the NARA, but it's under the state of Illinois. And one of the best in the country, and I would strongly uh, recommend it to you. Um, sometimes you see the number 14, and the confusion there, if you look under Gerald Ford, who's number eight, you'll see two names there for the city, Ann Arbor, Michigan, as well as Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
And what Gerald Ford did, which was the only president that's done that, is he has a library in one of the cities, and that's Ann Arbor, where University of Michigan is. And then he has his museum in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he grew up. And sometimes people call those as two rather than one. But as I said, they're interconnected and all the rest of the libraries are located in the same area. So let's go to the next slide. And we'll talk about how did this all get started? Who is the person behind it? And as we can see by looking at this picture here, it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he was our president longer than anybody else had just started his fourth term, fourth, in 1945, and then unfortunately dies. And he was the one who came up with this idea, we need to have US presidential libraries and museums. The library is where you do the scholarly work. And we've had incredible work done and finding out what the history of these administrations are, which is an important part of our own story, our own United States story. For example, uh, if you read a biography of uh, President Eisenhower, even 25 years ago, he was talked about as a caretaker president. You know, he had his marvelous career as a general, a uh, five-star general, supreme commander of the allies, the commander of the commanders. And he um, is that in a, he stands alone in that area. But he also was president of the United States. And many people thought, even as he was president, that he was just more a caretaker, just kind of sliding into retirement. But what we find out if we study the papers as the scholars have and written these wonderful biographies, he was a very active president and very much involved in his two terms. Um, the interstate highway um, system is one of his um, wonderful additions to our country. Um, he was very involved in stopping the Korean War, um, certainly with his military background. So. If you read a biography of Eisenhower, I would recommend that you read one that was written in the last uh, uh, 10 years. Um, um, so that's just giving you one example of, we need the scholarship to really understand what's real and, and what um, is not quite uh, the correct interpretation. So before Roosevelt came up with this idea, our very first president going to the slide, was of course George Washington. And he believed any paper, any document, any record that he had from the first administration and he served two terms belonged to him personally. And any artifact belonged to him personally. And that's of course where our museums go or it, the artifacts go in there. So if you go to Reagan's, uh, you see like the flying White House, um, the, um, where P, uh, the uh, Boeing uh, uh, 747 that flies and takes our presidents uh, all over the world. Uh, you also see Marine One there. And it's not a picture, it is actually the plane and the helicopter. Um, one of the things in Eisenhower's museum that you see, and, and I uh, saw a lecture uh, by the archivist from the Eisenhower Museum said, our most precious object in this museum is Eisenhower's address to the soldiers the night before the Normandy invasion. And it's three page speech and it's shown in the uh, museum. And it's obviously also um, uh, kept in, um, it actually belongs to the library. And um, it's a very moving speech. And um, if you wanna read something that's worthwhile, I recommend it, pulling it up. But what Eisenhower basically says is that he is, um, he's honored to be the leader of these great men and women that are fighting the war. Um, he is uh, proud to be their commander, <clears throat> excuse me. And what he says at the very end, which is just very moving, as you can tell my voice, um, he says, 
Um, we did everything we could to make this a successful operation. But if we fail, there's only one person to blame, and it is me. I'm the commander. I take the blame. I take the credit. Um, so, so anyway, that's uh, just one thing that you would see in the Eisenhower uh, Museum. Okay, so going back to Washington, he took everything with him. Uh, we have no idea what happened to it. Um, and, uh, I, and this, of course, bothered Roosevelt. And up until his time, what some people would do, would put it in the Library of Congress, which is our huge research center in the United States. And it's on Capitol Hill. And you have all kinds of over a million records are kept there. And so a lot of our libraries, uh, a lot of our presidents before Roosevelt would give their papers and their um, documents to the Library of Congress. Other people like John Adams, John Quincy Adams, would turn them over to the Massachusetts Historical Society. They did not want to keep them themselves. They realized the value and that American people needed to have these preserved and it really belonged to the people. Um, but unfortunately, many of these records, uh, artifacts were destroyed, lost or stolen. So Roosevelt beginning his third term and having tremendous amount of records and artifacts said, we need to get some kind of system here. And so he came up with the genius idea that we're going to combine the public and the private in this endeavor. And the public would be the government, the National Archives and Record Administration, and the private would be the president would establish a foundation and raise money. And the two purposes for the money was to buy land and to build a library and a museum there to put all these valuable uh, records and artifacts that we had. And he was the one who then implemented uh, this plan in uh, 1939. And he, his was the first library and museum and is actually a hundred miles north of New York City, a beautiful site right on by the Hudson River. And um, from his time forward, then all the presidents since then have had a museum and library built. Now, if you go back to the first page of the, uh, I meant to say this, uh, the one with all the, um, well, anyway, Roosevelt is the second one listed there. Thank you. Um, the first one is Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover chronologically was obviously before Roosevelt. Roosevelt had the idea. He implemented it. Hoover liked it so much. He's now the former president. So he had his library and museum uh, established in West Branch, Iowa, only Iowa president that we have. And I get this question often, where is West Branch, Iowa? <laughs> and it's just east of Iowa City. So uh, it's an easy five hour drive from here. You just go up straight up I-35 and then over I-80 and you see it. And it's worth seeing, it's a, it's a good library. Okay, let's continue going back. Okay, all right, so let's move to the next thing. Okay, and I love this picture. This is where our libraries and museums are located. And I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds to count the dots. <laughs> And if you came up with the number 14, then you have passed first grade arithmetic. That's the number, 14, okay? And you go, but Anita, you said there were 13. And I go, there's 13, but you gotta have two dots there for uh, President Ford because he has the library in Ann Arbor and he has the museum in Grand Rapids. So going from, if you look at the Northeast, we're going to go from East to West, right? So you start at uh, Boston area, which would be the first dot furthest uh, East or, or right where I'm looking. Uh, and it, that would be um, J JFK's library and museum. And it was built after his death because of course he was uh, unfortunately killed while he was in office. Then moving to the left, 
um, you would go, that would be New York and that would be President Roosevelt. And then continuing the two dots that are in Michigan, that would be Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids, that would be President Ford. And then right about in the center of the map, you have Iowa. So that obviously would be Hoover. And then you drop down and you have two that are very close to each other. The one um, that is in Missouri would, of course, be Truman. And the one on the other side would be Kansas. And that would be um, Abilene. And then you go to California. So you skip that huge area that we do have no libraries, but you have two in L.A., and the one on the top, further north, is uh, Reagan's. And the one just below that, in another suburb of L.A., is uh, President Nixon's. Then moving back over to uh, going back east, uh, you have three libraries, the most that any state has, libraries and museums. And they are in Texas, in that triangle there. And the top of the triangle would be Dallas. And Dallas, uh, that is where uh, President uh, Bush's library is located. And that would be um, President uh, George W. Bush. So it'd be Bush Jr. And then going down um, to the uh, uh, left-hand side, that would be um, um, Austin. And that is LBJ's library. And then next to it, the last one would be uh, President H. W. Bush's library, and that would be near the Houston area. Then going a little bit northeast, you'd have Arkansas, that's Little Rock, and that would be Clinton. And then going straight uh, east uh, to Georgia, you would have President um, um, Carter's. So those are the 13 with uh, actually 14 different sites. Um, now, how does a president make the decision and everything rests in the president's hands? If the president doesn't want to have a library museum, he doesn't have one. We just happen to have had since Hoover's time, now through Obama, that they've all said, yes, that's what I want. And the location is very, very important. Some of them like it in their place of birth. Um, and that would be true of, of Hoover. Um, he had it at his uh, place of birth. Um, so would Nixon. That's at his place of birth. Some like it where they have had a lot of connection and meaning. That would be true of Obama. Uh, Obama was born in Hawaii, spent a great deal of time in Chicago, also had connections with New York City, uh, attending Columbia University. All three of those areas were very interested in having the library there. And he and uh, Michelle uh, decided on Chicago. It's very prestigious for an area if they have a library and museum in this area. Abilene, Kansas is honored by having President Eisenhower choose that. That was not his birthplace. He was actually born in Denison, Texas, but his family at a young age moved to um, um, uh, Abilene and that what he called his home. Also Truman, that was not his home, Independence, where it's located, a suburb of Kansas City, Missouri, but um, that's where he spent a great deal of time. And just a very quick side note, uh, and President Truman is a wonderful storyteller, and one of his stories that he tells is, I really wanted the my museum and library in Grandview, Missouri. That's where my family farm was. And that's where I had uh, deep roots. And so the family farm, when they were deciding where it was to be built, was being farmed by two uncles of his. And he said, uh, he made this proposal and President Truman said, I can't repeat what they said, but it was not favorable. And they said, are you kidding, Harry? putting a library and museum on this valuable property, this wonderful Missouri dirt where we raise wonderful crops, you're out of your mind. And he said that ended the conversation. He never asked again. So that's how it ended up in uh, independence. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so when these people decide and they make the decision, uh, sometime during their administration, they bring it up. Uh, President Obama brought up very early in his first administration that he wanted a museum and library. He kept saying, I want it digital. 
and we weren't sure what that all meant, but now we do know because in June of this year, uh, they had their groundbreaking uh, ceremony, and we'll talk about that later. President Trump uh, has not said to this point if he wants a museum and library. And we obviously, President Biden has been in office less than a year and has not made any uh, mention of it. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Okay, now here's a, one of the critical of slides here, and we'll go through this quickly, but it deserves a lot of uh, discussion. Um, why do we do this? We spend a lot of money on these buildings. They're built with private funds. But then we turn them over to the NARA and their government buildings. They're owned by them and they're administered by them. And I didn't quite say that, but that's how we get the private, the foundation and the government marrying and doing this uh, uh, building and a persever uh, a preserving of this history. So the pro is we save our history and, and I, uh, is a, I'm a historian. I, um, that's what my undergraduate degree in. I, I love understanding our past so we can understand our present and, and build on that to have a better future. Um, I, I believe very strongly in that. I'm, as most people who love history, they like their own family history, their genealogy, where we came from, uh, where we're going, and, and where we are right now. Uh, so that's the pro. The con is um, people go, what we're doing is our country was based on the principle of our first three words of our U.S. Constitution, we the people. And we're making these men, and they've all been men so far, uh, as little gods, as queens, as kings. And um, that isn't who we are. We're, we're getting out of you know, what we the people are about by putting too much emphasis on one person um, who was the leader of our country for um, so many years. Um, the other one, and it's probably even a stronger argument, though it flows so much from this royalty idea, is that um, when you go to these libraries and museums, there's a bias. Obviously, they want to show the president in the best light possible, but in doing this, they might be um, downplaying what history really was. And the three that are criticized the most on that are Nixon's library in uh, the LA area, also Reagan's library, which is in the LA area, and the last one is Clinton. And what has happened is that with Nixon, it's the Watergate. And it wasn't that it, that it happened, this break into the Democratic headquarters, but it was the cover up. And if you go to Nixon's library, it's, um, you know, there's, um, you know, there was this little burglary that happened and um, it had some fallout and uh, th then life moved on. Well, life did move on. It was very impactful on Nixon resigning before he finished his second term. Uh, the one on Clinton, if you go, um, and um, his whole uh, uh, problems um, with um, lying about uh, his personal relationships, um, and, and again, uh, bringing charges against him, impeachment charges against him, which held up that he lied uh, to people that asked him to uh, uh, be truthful about uh, his um, uh, personal life and professional life. And um, it was an obstruction of justice. And he was, they upheld that. Uh, they didn't, they never removed him from office, but he was an impeached president. Um, then the last one is Reagan, and Reagan's second term was haunted by the Iran-Contra incident, where we as a country had said we are not selling arms anymore to Middle East countries. We unfortunately did under Reagan. Um, it was a secret uh, arrangement to Iran, and then we took that money and gave it to um, a country in South America to help them revolt and have a more democratic government. There is not one word said about the Iran-Contra in uh, 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 Reagan's library. So um, 
those are the two problems that we have and nothing's perfect, um, but uh, those are things that are often raised about it. Okay, I think uh, we'll move to the next slide. Now, let's talk about Eisenhower and um, one of, uh, in Abilene. And um, this is, uh, you know, just straight off of I-70. It's a wonderful uh, place to visit. Uh, it has been alive and well since uh, the 1960s. It's a very traditional library, mm -hmm. contrary to Truman's, which is much more what we call the more modern era. And we'll talk about that in a second. And if you look at the next slide, um, the campus of Eisenhower, if you haven't been there, you will be just overwhelmed. It's beautiful. It's well done. And there are actually six places in this gorgeous uh, 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 courtyard. So if the keys are, if you look at the upper right hand, is number one, the museum. And then at the bottom is the library. So the two cornerstones are the museum and the library. And then in between is this beautiful, powerful statue of <laughs> President uh, um, Eisenhower in his uh, World War II outfit, and we'll get to that in a minute. And this is unique. In none of the other 13 libraries and museums is there a place of meditation. It's a beautiful chapel. And that's where Ike and Mamie are buried and a third person is buried, their eldest son, who died in, uh, at the age of three. Um, and it's, he was very insistent, insistent that that be part of this whole complex. And he says, we need a place to reflect. We need to spend more time thinking and planning rather than always acting. It's, it's worth going just to see that. And then we have Ike's boyhood home. And this is why it's always good to have the libraries and museums built in an area which the president lived because then you can also go through the home. And this home is, is unique, it's beautiful, it's Victorian. And there were yes. six boys raised in that family. And you go, I don't know where they put those boys, you know, <laughs> big men. Okay, and then we have the visitor center. All right, going to the next slide. This is, and I guess I get carried away here. This is the place of meditation that is right in the courtyard, beautiful fountain in, in front of it, right? And presidents, every president, but um, two, and you can probably figure out um, who they are, um, have been buried on their property, uh, their uh, library and museum. And um, the two that have not, one has said uh, he, he's still living, but he doesn't want to be buried at his library and museum. The first one was John Kennedy. Okay. He's buried in Arlington. And his wife, obviously the first lady, said that uh, that's where she preferred him to be buried. And, and he was never moved to the library and museum after it was constructed. The second one is uh, President Carter. And his library and museum is in Atlanta. Georgia, and he says, I do not want to be buried there, nor, nor does my former first lady. Uh, we want to be buried where we came from, which is Plains, Georgia. But all the rest, when you go to these library museums, you can visit their a grave site. Okay. Okay. All right, this is the uh, awesome statue that is uh, in the courtyard. And this is the famous uh, World War II jacket of President uh, Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. It is 11 feet tall, it's bronze, it's very, um, uh, it's awesome. It's, it's, again, worth going just to see that. Okay, going to the next slide, okay. All right, this is the interior of Eisenhower, and it's very similar to most of the libraries. Um, the libraries now, and, and in 2018, there was a, close to $30 million to renovate the Eisenhower Museum. So it has a fresh look to it. It's, it's well done. 
um, they basically kept the floor plan the same, which is that you do a circle around. So you enter from the front, the library at the very low part of the page there. And then this is very typical. They talk about their early years. Um, and then you have the third thing is the educational center. That's like the auditorium, the meeting rooms. And then President Eisenhower, he, was, he had two fantastic careers. So they spend a lot of time talking about World War II. And then uh, there's a big uh, unit, a uh, big part on his presidency. All 13 of the library, uh, libraries have a huge tribute to the first lady. And this is true in Eisenhower as well as the other 12. And then you come around and you have the farewell, you can exit there. Or what all libraries do is they have special exhibits that um, they bring in. Um, and um, one of the best ones uh, that is getting rave reviews is um, George W. Bush's library has a special exhibit on immigration. And he and Reagan uh, did a lot with immigration and, and most historians said, because one was uh, governor of Texas, one was governor of California, they understood immigration more than some of our presidents and leaders have. Going to the next slide, we'll go to our next person and that of course is President Truman. And this $30 million renovation is magnificent. I went there, it was open from the 4th of July until the third week of July, and then it was closed again, as all of them were. And during that time, I was very fortunate. I went out and flew out to LA and saw the President Reagan Library, which is worth going to LA to see. And then I also saw uh, the Truman. Uh, what they have done is not only have they improved the um, a whole layout of it, but the content is, is really, really done well. Um, you used to, if any of you went to the Truman Library, and I'm sure the, many of you did, you entered right at, the, uh, right at the front of it. And it was, you know, so the main door was right in the front between those columns. What they have done is they have moved the entryway to the east side of the building and it's the parking lot. And so you enter, so you're in the parking lot here and you see Harry there in a, as a statue form waving to you as you walk in. Okay. And um, let's go to the next part here. Okay. okay. And I'm not going to read you all this because there's a lot on here, but um, this $30 million renovation they refer to as refreshing and re-imaging. And one of my questions was, as soon as I heard that they were doing this, are they going to save that magnificent Thomas Hart Benton mural, which is right in the center as you walked in from the old entry? And the answer is yes, they did. And it's the winning of the West and it's, it's one of the best murals in the United States. Okay. What they did to the Truman Library was rather they used to have it the old way on the first on the top floor was um, his adult life. And on the bottom part was his boyhood and a lot of cars. And <laughs> they decided, first of all, we didn't need all the cars. And secondly, we we're going to keep it all on one level and we're going to do the big C circle. OK, so you enter from the east side. You then come more towards the center. So you're going from right to left and you see the big, beautiful Thomas Hart mural. Um, mural. And then you go through his pre-political life, his political life, and then his post-life. Nobody was more invested in his library and museum than Harry Truman. He lived there in his post-presidential um, uh, years. He often would give uh, speeches because he would be on site when uh, uh, children would come. He would often, often answer the phone and say, could I help you? And people would say, uh, who is this person Truman we're talking to? He goes, yes, mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're called. I wanted to visit with you today. <laughs> okay. Uh, his uh, burial site is um, right outside. And let's go to the next slide. Okay. 
Um, as you walk in, and, and this is really well done, and these two pictures were both taken by me with my camera, so you're seeing people in it that you shouldn't. So that gentleman there just <laughs> happened to be strolling by. And if you look at the bottom part, which is the Thomas Benton uh, mural, there's someone standing in the doorway, and uh, I kept waiting for the person to move, and I got impatient, so I just took the picture. Okay. So as you walk into this east entry, this glassway, you look out to the right and you see the beautiful courtyard and where Truman, uh, Harry Truman and his wife Bess are buried, plus their daughter and son-in-law. And you used to miss that when it was the old way because you couldn't find it. It was way back there. It's very well done and it's very open. And then, as I said, they uh, retain the, the Thomas Hart year uh, Thomas Hart Benton mural. Okay, All right. Now, one of the things about, and, and this, is the, this is the new wave of presidential libraries, not just to say, here it is. And obviously we have a certain bias because we're very pro Eisenhower, we're very pro Johnson, whoever it is that uh, we're connected with, but give the nuances of history. And notice the next line, present the facts and draw your own conclusion. Now, the listing of facts, of events here, atomic bomb down to Korean War, within the first four months, four months of Harry Truman taking over as president in April of 45, he had to deal with all of these. It's incredible how the man rose to the office. And one of the most controversial things he did, we knew that Japan was going to surrender. Uh, Germany, Germany surrendered in April. And then of course, in August, Japan uh, surrendered. We're talking obviously about World War II is uh, we knew they were gonna surrender Japan. It was just how quickly, how many more lives had to be lost and right or wrong, uh, President Truman decided that we were going to use our atomic weapon, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Very controversial. What they do at the library is they um, present both sides. Uh, General Marshall was very, very opposed to this. One of the greatest generals we've ever had in the United States. Uh, there's letters from Japan. There are pictures of Japanese that are uh, so uh, scarred and burned from the aftermath of this, uh, these bombs, uh, you can hardly look at the pictures. Uh, so you, and, and the question is, was this the right way to do it? You know, and the answer is yes, but, no, but. And, but that's how they're presenting these history now in these museums. Um, there's no black and white, there's no, Yes, it was right. Yes, right. It was there are nuances to this. And the Truman Library is doing this very well. Okay, moving on to the next one is um, the technology in there. And this is true of uh, Eisenhower's. It's improved remarkably. A lot of interactive activities, videos, touchscreen activities. Okay, we'll move to the next one. And this is the last thing that I want to talk about. And I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because, to be honest with you, the jury is still out. <laughs> President Obama, since he entered office, said, I am not going to have a physical library. We are not going to store all these documents in paper form. We're going to do it digital. And that's what he is doing. There is no physical library that is being built. It is all digital records. And they are being supervised as they should by the NARA, the National Archives Records Administration to preserve, renew, and you can read all that. Okay, that is a huge, huge difference. And people are going, whoa, what happened here? Okay. <laughs> He has said this from day one, we didn't understand it. I, I've done a lot of research on it. It's, fine to, it's hard to find any articles on it because I don't think a lot of people are aware of this. Now the other two things that are, he has changed 
is. And according to their five laws in regard to United States presidential libraries and museums, it never says you have to have physical buildings. It says the job of the NARA is to preserve and share these oh, wow. documents, these artifacts, but there's nothing about mm -hmm. physical. Now, the next thing is there are three buildings that are being built in, and you can see them. And the one in the middle that looks like a lantern, okay. like light, you know, giving okay. out light. And this is in Southern, a South part of Chicago. Uh, it's very close, as I mentioned, to University of Chicago. Um, this is the museum. And um, that's where the artifacts will be stored, the videos and, and you know, where visitors will be more than welcome. Right below the, that, the, uh, the building, right in front of it, I guess I would say, uh, there are two other structures. And those are the form, and that's on the slide. And that's a community building, you know, the restaurant, the auditorium, the gift shop. And then the other one-story building is the educational citizenship building. It is anticipated, what we know of President Obama, he was a community leader. He was always involved in educating people before he became a U.S. Senator and then uh, President of the United States. He has a very strong commitment, as does his wife, uh, First Lady, Michelle Obama, into educating of people, getting people involved. The government is good. It can only be better if we have the right people in the right places and that he will spend a great deal of time there, right? Now, the key, and I went over it a little quickly, is that those buildings, the museum, those three buildings are going to be owned by the, um, uh, uh, by the uh, Obama Foundation. They will not, they are not being transferred to the NARA. Why, we're not quite sure what the whole uh, reason nor the uh, impact will be. Right, let's go to the last slide and then we're just about on time so I can hear from you, okay. Um, one of the wonderful articles that I've read said, um, Obama's library is not your grandparents' library. And, you know, it's, it's, it, isn't a life. it isn't a physical building. And we're in a modern age, and he is the first digital president, okay? Now, there's been pros and cons here. And the, con, the pros are that these documents will be much more accessible and they'll be cheaper. We just go online and pull them up. The concern is uh, we have NARA in charge of all this. Are we going to have some huge data dump and we can't find what we want to find? And, you know, it goes on and on. And you go, well, uh, the government can figure this out. At least we hope. Okay. All right. So, um, as I said at the very beginning, the, the the judgment is out on this. Is this the wave of the future or is this just a little blip? And, and is, first of all, is Trump going to have a library and museum? Is it going to be physical structures? Is Biden going to go? So we're at a real turning point right now in this whole concept of presidential libraries and museums. And I want to end, if I could, and then we'll open it up to questions and comments, is I think FDR, our man who had this genius idea, uh, has said it right. And he said this at his um, a groundbreaking ceremony of the library and museum. He said, there are three characteristics that we have to have in order to be a great nation. And the first is we have to treasure our past. We have to treasure our past. And then we have to believe in our future. That's our second characteristic. But the third one is the most important. We have to have confidence in our current generation that they have learned from the past in order to build a better future. And I think that's what these libraries and museums are all about. And on that, 
I'm finished, except we have the exciting part of hearing from you and making comments and uh, questions. So let's open it up to everybody. Very informative, Anita. This is Jim. Very informative. I have one question. Yes. Do you have any idea of the range of cost, the initial cost of the various libraries, just a range? Yes, I do. Uh, they have gone from 50 million, which has been more in the FDR time and Hoover time. Now, I've got this figure right, 555 five, five million for Obama. Oh. Okay. Now, Obama's is a complex. Um, he's wants, um, uh, uh, he, he wants it to be a community affair. He's having uh, Chicago Public Library be on the campus. Um, he's having uh, a, a lot of open green spaces. Uh, his concept is, is much broader than probably FDR's ever was or Herbert Hoover's. So does that answer your question, Jim? Yes, it does. Thank you. And Nita, this is yeah. Dave. This is Dave. Uh, you know, when you when you talk about the museums and libraries, when I think of a, a library, I think of probably going in there and sitting down and doing a lot of research on some sort of subject. But when you go inside the libraries, are there things to, to look at there, or are there just books? Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm talking about what what? Do you yeah, most of them are more the traditional library that you're talking about. Okay. Uh, the Truman Library interesting if you've gone to that they have the old the replica of the oval office in there most live most museums have it in their museum part um so um they it's it's basically the traditional concept of a library dave okay thank you yeah this is kathleen Yes, Kathleen. What is your favorite of the libraries you have visited? Okay. I was very, uh, thank you for asking that. I am very partial to our two, uh, Obama, uh, pardon me, Obama's uh, Freudian <laughs> slip, um, our two which are uh, Eisenhower and Truman. I think they're incredibly well done. And um, that's what got me into it. When I moved here in 1970 and I got a job as a English and history and government teacher in a high school and, and, and I love museums. I go, wow, we have two treasures right here, you know? And um, they're, they're extremely well done. And, and I like the concept of Truman of about, you know, forcing us to come to grips with our history and come to conclusions of ourself, ourself and not, you know, this is this and that is that. Um, I, I think um, I'm very partial towards uh, Eisenhower. I think he was one of our greatest leaders and both as a general and as a president and his presidency was underrated. I, the location of um, uh, Kennedy's, it's right over the Atlantic Ocean. It's very modern, it's steel. It was very much all, in fact, it all was done by the first lady since his, he was deceased at the time, is very attractive. Um, I think one of the most underrated presidents, and I think his library is, and museum is well done, is um, President uh, Ford. Um, so uh, very long-winded answer. <laughs> like them all. Anita? Yes. Is, is the Truman Library open again? No, it's not. Yeah. What the Truman Library is doing, and I, I wish, and I, I'm getting on my soapbox here, I wish the Eisenhower would do it more. They're very good at PR. And what they're doing is um, they have uh, lectures. I, I went to one uh, uh, two weeks ago. It was actually held at the Nelson. It was an hour and a half lecture on Franklin Roosevelt very well done, brought in us one of these amazing scholars that have written, you know, more books than I could ever read, probably, on Franklin Roosevelt. Um, uh, so they're doing a lot of outreach. They're also doing, and some of you are involved in it, it's called the Truman Library Institute. They're doing these little half-hour presentations on Truman's life right now. 
there at 4 to 4.30 on Thursday. And if you're a member, you can uh, get on there or even if you're a non-member. Um, so the answer is, uh, you know, they're all under the same rules, except, you know, uh, Obama, uh, and it's not built yet. But it, they're all under NARA, and if one library is closed, they're all closed. And so they're all closed at this time. Wow. I would agree that that chapel in Abilene is special. Mm -hmm. It is sacred. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I, it's one of my favorite spots, yeah. I agree. Uh, how, how many of you have been to libraries? And I, I'd like to hear, Dave, what, what's uh, your reaction? Well, I've been to Truman, I've been to Eisenhower, both of them are, are great. Um, you know, sometimes if you really like museums, I, I sometimes will sometimes take two days to do a museum because mm -hmm. I think I, I only have tolerance for so long at a museum. I mean, even when it's a good one, uh, because, you know, you're standing all the time and and sometimes mm -hmm. you really get a good museum. Sometimes you have to stay two or three hours and then take a rest and come back again the next day. But yeah, I have not been to the new the new Truman Museum. I was at the old mm -hmm. one. But uh, that was a good point about the, the, the grave sites, about the Truman Library, because I had no idea it was over there. Mm -hmm. I went through the first time. You, you you'll know. see it right away the minute yeah. you walk in that east entrance. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been to both of those. Yep. Mm -hmm. I've been to the George Bush Library in College oh, Station. Well, tell us about it. And that's, that was beautiful. That was absolute. And again, I agree with, with Dave, you almost need two days to absorb everything. Yeah, and, and which George Bush Library was it? The one in College Station. Okay, Is it George, okay. So that would be uh, HW. W, w yeah. HW, yeah, okay. yes. All right, so it would and be- And that's quite uh, spectacular. Yeah, dear, near Houston, yeah. Right. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just chomping at the bit to go to both of those libraries. Mm -hmm. Anybody else been to a library that they want to share an insight on? Yeah, Pat? Well, I have been both to the Truman and the Eisenhower, but um, I don't remember, might have been the first one that I went to Hoover's because um, of having grown up in Iowa and being back there for vacations often, uh, the thing that I remember most was how impressed I was with what an accomplished person Hoover was. Mm -hmm. He's really gotten a bad reputation as a president for the uh, depression, which is not entirely his fault, and um, his accomplishments as a humanitarian, as an engineer, uh, are really very impressive. Well, you hit on a, 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 a sore point with me, Pat, and, and I'm not sure sore, but a, a raw point. Uh, I'm from Iowa, so I'm very partial towards uh, Hoover. So let's start with getting you know <laughs> that known right around. Well, and when I was a I can't tell you how many years ago, but a senior in college, and we had to write a senior paper for our history in order to get the, you know, our history degree. And of course, I decided I was going to defend Hoover, you know, the, you know, because he, you say Hoover and you say Great Depression and Hoover Bill and all those things. Um, one of the things about Hoover, which I think is interesting, besides what you say, who's a a brilliant engineer, uh, educated at Stanford, you know, and, and helped with World War One, you know, with uh, delivering food before and after, saved millions of people from starving to death, not mi millions, thousands, I'll say. Um, but um, he was of a Quaker bright background, very independent type of people, you know, uh, and, and they believe strongly and self-reliant in who they are. And he was a self-made man. He was an orphan. Uh, his parents died at a very um, young age. And uh, he was raised by an aunt and uncle. And he made it. And he not only made it, he was a very wealthy, successful businessman, brilliant man. Okay? Uh, wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, didn't quite fit into um, what, you know, well, I've said enough. <laughs> uh, no personal opinion. And I promised myself I wasn't going to do that. I apologize. Anybody else? Uh, you know, if any? I can say one more thing about the Eisenhower Museum, and I agree with Jim that Meditation Center is really good, but it's such a great place because it, it, it kind of, it has everything there. The, the home is there, the, mm -hmm. the visitor center is there, 
the museum is there, the meditation center is there, and just walking in there and seeing two graves of, of, of a very, very popular president in the, in the middle of Kansas is pretty, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. and, and pretty uplifting to, to see something like that and just know you're standing <clears throat> right there amongst somebody who's very very famous right in our own state of kansas it's just it's just mm -hmm. a nice it's a nice thank you Dave. It's, a, it's a nice visit mm -hmm. yeah, maybe a comment one more comment and then we'll somebody yeah uh helen i've been to a number of the libraries but i think i went to a couple of them when they were just getting started Mm -hmm. The JFK Library. I'd mm -hmm. like to go. I'd like to go back to them. I love the fact that you gave us the map, and we could actually do a road trip to all of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, let me know when you're going. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've been to the uh, Clinton Museum twice, yeah. and there was like five years between the two visits. The second time, I saw a lot of different things than what I saw the first time. But the first time, Dave, I've spent all day there, yeah. all by myself, just seeing that museum. Mm. And the second time I was with a, a group of my classmates from U of A at a reunion we had. So it was a different kind of experience for sure. That was initially described by some people as looking like a big trailer. <laughs> uh, Jim, I'm glad you said that. I, I you are? Phyllis will say that to I she just we were talking before and I said uh, I went to Clinton's library about uh, three months after it was open and I thought I hope they've improved the grounds and uh, it just looks like a box car on stilts. Uh, I'm not sure who the designer was, but uh, uh, and uh, again, very personal opinion that uh, it does not belong here. <laughs> But once you're inside, it's interesting. Yeah, that's right. Well, um, I see Debbie, uh, thank you for arranging this and uh, letting me uh, speak. And um, I've learned a lot just from hearing uh, these insightful comments at the end. And um, I wish you well and uh, enjoy this beautiful fall that we're having. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Anita. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Anita. Yeah. Thanks, thank you, Anita. Anita. Thank, thank you. you, Anita. Thank you. Thank you.